Great. Hello and um, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our panel discussion this evening. The topic is, of course, crisis competence, which is actually a term that was coined by a research scientist named Mark Brennan Ng. And um, he is uh, a scientist, but he is also um, a doctor and he heads up something called the Brookdale uh, Center for Healthy Aging. And I just wanna read you a quote by um, Dr. Ng. As we get older, we get the sense that we're going to be able to handle anything because we've been able to handle challenges in the past. You know you can eventually get past it, that there are things that happen and there's an end to it and there is a life after that. And so um, this talk is uh, a panel discussion with, uh, I'm joined by the wonderful, wonderful um, storied careers and storied lives of the performers of the Performing Arts Legacy Project. Um, but before we actually begin, and um, I think it's important uh, given that so much of this is going to be a reflection on um, this crisis competence, what is it to um, have gone through this pandemic year? And mm -hmm. what can we learn from these, these wonderful artists and what they have gone through? We have just reached a milestone in this country of 500,000 souls lost. And um, it's important that we take a moment, just a moment of silence, just to acknowledge that and the gravity of what this is. And I would be remiss if I hadn't, um, if I didn't share that I was, I was thinking of um, Mark Blum, a teacher and a wonderful artist who um, we lost to COVID this year, as, as we have lost so many souls. But so this, this notion of crisis competence, um, I really want to take a moment to um, introduce our, our incredible panel, panel, and especially the founder and the director of the Performing um, Arts Legacy Project, uh, Ms. Joan Jeffrey. Joan is, um, well, th this was first housed at Columbia and now it's housed at uh, the Actors Fund. She is a scholar, former director of the Program of Arts Administration at Columbia University, past president of the Association of Arts Administration and Educators, and the International Arts Medicine Association. Incredible. And um, her own disciplines have spanned a wide spectrum of all of the arts, ranging from the visual arts to jazz, to performing artists, to, to all of it. And um, she uses her rigorous study to advocate for, for all artists. Um, and she was also a student of Miss Uta Hawkins. So welcome, Joan. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Um, I want to introduce our other panelists as well. Um, you will actually receive a link that will give you, you know, more information about the panelists, but I want, I want to share some quotable quotes and things like that about our panelists. So Virginia Wing is a Chinese American actress whose uh, ancestors came from Gold Mountain in Canton. Um, and she is currently writing a book about growing up Southern in the Mississippi Delta where she was born and raised, but professionally, she is a multi-hyphenate. Um, her performances and her legacy spans from opera to cabaret to theater to film. She was a former Breck girl and is in the Breck Hall of Fame, was a nominee for the Best Actress um, in the Hollywood NAAC, uh, NAACP Image Award. <clears throat> and she is a grandmother. Welcome, Virginia. It's so great to have you here. Um, Barbara Kahn, we hope, is going to be able to join us. She was having, I think, a uh, Wi-Fi. She's, here. Wi She's uh, here. Yeah, she was there. She is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Barbara is here. Fantastic. 
Oh, terrific, Barbara. So Barbara, I'm just gonna read some quotes from your bio if you don't mind. Um, I love this. Actor, director, and playwright are not just what I do, they are who I am. And uh, she studied with so many wonderful uh, teachers in New York, including Ellen Stewart of La Mama. Um, a very, very beautiful um, bio. Um, became a director when she had to um, replace a director who'd been fired just two weeks prior to opening. <laughs> Talk about resilience, right? Um, I love this. I hope you don't mind that I'm <laughs> quoting you on this. Artists have stories inside of us that we nurture and share, legacy stories of our ancestors, stories from our life experience and stories that we imagine. Brecht's Mother Courage is my favorite play, says Barbara, I do, reminding me of my grandmother's, my grandmother's bravery and ingenuity fighting against prejudice and oppression. Um, Barbara has written more than 25 historical plays, and she says it is with the goal of holding a mirror to the present. And I, I'm just going to embarrass you for a moment, Barbara, uh, with a quote from Pauline uh, Simmons um, of NewYorkTheaterWire.com, who said of you, Barbara Kahn is something rare in theater and historian and playwright, aiming for our heads and our hearts. She tweaks our intellect and kindles our emotions. And finally, um, Barbara says that her life in theater has been governed by a passion for justice and for equality. As George Sand wrote, all I want is for people to question the accepted lies and call out the forgotten truths. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> Glenn Kubota was born and raised in the Central Valley of California and grew up working in fields moved to New York City in 1979 and worked in the theater, as he says, to find his natural voice. As a voice teacher, I teach voice and speech here at HB Studio. I'm very interested in that, as you might imagine. Um, he's worked in all kinds of theater, film, television. Latest credits, Aubergine by Julia Cho at Old New Theater, um, uh, Maplethorpe, and recent TV and streaming credits have included FBI and Daredevil. And Glenn, I have to read this quote from your bio about you. You say, your immersion in the performing arts was a journey of difficult and at times humiliating work in search of an inner truth about yourself. Um, and you say of yourself, he had been largely successful to that end and is now in search of a new inner truth. I'd love to hear more about that. Um, and Jasper, welcome Jasper, a New Thank York City-based performer who was offered work and a place to stay by Ellen Stewart in 1979. So there's another Ellen Stewart uh, connection. Um, he's the veteran of many uh, pieces uh, at La Mama, uh, Caucasian Chalk Circle, another direct play, hired as a dancer in the opera Lily um, and worked at New York City Opera and Lincoln Center a uh, veteran of fringe festivals in Edinburgh, Glasgow, Stirling Castle. Um, it's also a teacher, has worked with a Scottish Youth Theater in a summer improv program. Um, you were also in Einstein on the Beach in the World Tour in 1992. And I'll be curious, I know you said that you were planning on reprising your role of Hoke in driving Miss Daisy, and that was to happen in the spring of 2020. And I do hope it happened. I suspect it was interrupted by the pandemic, but I hope you got to revisit Hope. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna happen. We're gonna make it happen. Um, and finally, Bill Koch, who is a multi-hyphenate, if I have ever um, heard of one. And multi-hyphenate is something that my students at NYU all seek to be. Um, uh, dancer, singer, actor, choreographer, stage director, musical director, stage manager, set <laughs> designer, uh, puppeteer, mime, never learned to juggle. There's always tomorrow. Uh, a playwright, composer, lyricist, and a poet. An early mentor taught me, he says, even if you're working at a non-theater job, remember you are a theater artist. Look at these other jobs as research. He journeyed from ballet dancer to show dancer, 
um, has several poetry collections, which you can find on Mapping the Legacy if you go to the, um, the Powell website. I love this quote by you. Anyone can learn the techniques of theater, but no one can teach you the dream. Follow your dream. I just love that. Um, and with that, um, there's, a, there's a wonderful quote, one of my um, favorite quotes by uh, a woman named uh, Brene Brown um, is from her book, Rising Strong, which her book is entirely about resilience. And she describes people who are able to be quite resilient as acquiring a skill that she calls discomfort tolerance, that it's, uh, it's key to being able to rise up and remain resilient. And I, my first question, and it, it's for everybody or, or anybody, um, would you be willing to share what you feel in your life has perhaps helped you navigate um, this pandemic, navigate isolation, navigate having to perhaps acquire new skill sets. Does anybody want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll jump in. yeah um, my most recent production was, was uh, halted just five days before opening night when the theaters were closed. Mm. So it was like going from free fall from all the excitement and, and the, the cast, the crew, the, my co-director, everybody, to being alone in a studio apartment in the middle of Manhattan in lockdown. And, and it took me um, a couple of days to just gather my resources. And what I started thinking about, um, which surprised me, was my grandmother, who in the midst of stranded in Eastern Europe in the midst of a war zone with four children, got them all safely across Europe by way of Cuba, joining my grandfather in Philadelphia. And I thought, if that mother courage can do that, then I can, I can tackle what's happening now. And the first thing I thought of doing was writing about those feelings, almost like a journal. And, and I don't write poetry. I don't write short stories or novels. I write plays because I come from an acting background. So for me, um, just writing, it was almost like a stream of consciousness. And this experience of relating feelings and, and what's come up on the news and so on, um, you know, some of the political horrible stuff about children in cages when I think about my grandmother and my father, who was four years old when this happened. Um, you know, it, 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 it reminded me of, of so many stories that I heard from my, my relatives. And it's, it's turning into a book, a graphic memoir. I'm, I'm working with um, an illustrator who's a friend of my sister, who's a brilliant, brilliant artist. And nobody's more shocked at this than I am. <laughs> so that's kind of how I, I just started navigating the situation. But I also want to quickly add that um, as terrible as it is, only Broadway's dark. Mm. Everything else is, is more active than I've ever seen it before. And while it's not a substitute for in-person, although some of it is in-person when that's possible, including the theater where I work, although I'm not able to participate because of you know, the, the safety precautions and being a high risk. Um, but there's so much going on. I have finally had to limit myself to no more than two Zoom events per day because my eyes were hurting and, and I was fatigued from it. So um, anyway, that's kind of where I'm at with it now. And this is actually my first Zoom event today. And it took me 45 minutes to get online with it. Oh, no. So I apologize for being late, but <laughs> oh, no. uh, I'm technically challenged as is my computer. <laughs> <laughs> no, and you made it. It's it's great. It's all good, Barbara. No, the yeah. Zoom, the whole technology thing. It's like, oh gosh, yeah, it's it's crazy. 
for, you know, for all of us. But that's, that's just beautiful. There's something, um, it's such a lesson about leaning into what it is that you do, you know, and as artists, what do we do? We create, you know, and there cer certainly is a lot of raw material, right? With, with everything going on. Um, what about anyone else? I mean, how are you coping with the things like the isolation? How, how has that been for you? Yeah, Bill. Um, yeah, um, the, uh, as, as Barbara has stated, I, I also, my creative gifts, you know, got me through a lot. The most exciting thing was in the early months of the pandemic shutdown, I finally completed a play I started 60 years earlier. And <laughs> yeah. after I did, I realized it was that it took me that long to know how to end it. So that was kind of a fun thing. <laughs> and uh, and also I have I just eternally grateful to Joan and the people with this project. As I said to Joan at one point not long ago, before coming into the project, I was a retired theater professional. My juices are now flowing again. I've already acted and directed. I'm acting in a beautiful, beautiful play next month, and then directing another one. So I feel like I'm a theater, an active theater person again, which is wonderful. And I also have to give a shout out. One thing that's helped me get through the shutdown is I've been in 12-step programs. And in two weeks, I'll be celebrating 33 years away from drugs and alcohol. Wow. I don't care what anyone else does. I'm allergic. And I did my part, but also it belongs to everybody in these programs. And the discipline there absolutely changed my work in theater over the years and it's helped me get through this pandemic so thanks that is wonderful bill thank you so much for that. Yeah. and kind of based on what barbara uh said as a person of color in this society we've been uh, very tolerant for hundreds of years so if you're uh, waiting for uh, the Gumbaya moment to uh, happen in this uh, country, I don't think it's going to happen in my lifetime. And it hasn't happened, you know, in, certainly in the uh, past. We're moving closer to it in terms of uh, consciousness, but it, uh, takes, uh, it takes time. So if I'm able to deal with, uh, with uh, just the situation of this country on a daily basis, and uh, still find a way to have uh, love in my heart. Uh, this little year that we've been in is uh, very uh, insignificant in terms of the greater life uh, issues and universe. It's, it's, not, it's not just us, it's the whole world. Mm -hmm. That's beautifully said, Jasper. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, for that wisdom. I'd like to, I'd like, I'd like to speak about uh, resilience. So I've, uh, I've mentioned this before in some of our group chats on the PAL. And uh, I grew up in the uh, Central Valley and Central Valley, California is uh, all agricultural. And uh, at a very early age, I worked in the fields and I worked alongside uh, the Bereceros. You know, Bereceros are the uh, Hispanic uh, Americans or Hispanic uh, people who follow the crops, different states. And so my introduction to working was working with these people. And at the time, I didn't know in terms of their, uh, of their work ability. I just assumed that they were working. That's how everybody worked. But it wasn't until that I left uh, to go away to college and, and come to New York and find different uh, environments and different people, I, I realized that the, the level of work that I had learned, the level of, of uh, what, what you call a tolerance, discom tolerance, discomfort, it, it, was, it, was, it was kind of amazing because what those people do in the fields every day mm -hmm. for eight, 10 hours, mm -hmm. that is a very high bar of discomfort and tolerance right. and it, it was just a, a a really good measure for me to measure myself against what effort involves and what uh, tolerance involves 
And I just remember back a lot of times when I thought I was having it hard here in New York City, I would think back, oh, wait a minute, no, that wasn't as hard as picking tomatoes, you know, at three o'clock, <laughs> three o'clock in the afternoon. Right. So uh, I, I think those kinds of early experiences uh, for me were, were very, very helpful, uh, particularly in this business. Absolutely. That's true. I had the opposite uh, feeling. Um, I live in a studio apartment, small, and I was not, um, I felt good. I, it, I, I realized I'm really sort of a, a hermit. <laughs> and I was very comfortable being by myself. Um, but then I started wondering why I was so comfortable being by myself. And I, it was almost like I had a roommate who was the other me. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I was doing this exploration of this person, like going through her life and uh, wondering why. And it, <laughs> it was really interesting. You know, actors do that. It's like, you remember, everybody remembers when they were crying and you're going, oh, I feel this. Yes. I feel, <laughs> you know, we all do that. So yeah. it uh, was an exploration of that. And uh, I realized why I always felt alone because I was born and raised in Mississippi <laughs> and I'm probably the only Chinese actress who has a Southern accent. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I was always trying to fit into the white world because in Mississippi, there's only the blacks and the whites, right? So I, tr in order not to be suppressed, I tried to be white my whole life. And so I tried to fit into what um, producers, directors, um, casting people, consider what an Asian is. And Asians have to be born in Asia. They have to have an accent. They have to speak the native tongue. And I did none of those things. <laughs> so um, it's those kind of the combination of everything. I realized that that other Virginia was working against a lot of things and not being really who she was. And that interferes with everything. You're acting in everything. So it was a turning inside for me. That's, that's profound. That's really profound, mm -hmm. Virginia. Have any of you found yourself um, in this pandemic um, year have, have any of you found yourself engaging in some activism online you know it's not possible necessarily to go up you know and be out there necessarily i mean my knees won't let me go out there and, and march you know but like i found myself you know helping actually helping others navigating mm -hmm. um helping others navigate um vocal health issues right yeah. as you know when they would go to their protests and whatnot have any of you kind of engaged in that way online or? Jasper, you were very active, right? Uh, no, was last year an election year? I yeah. mean, it seems so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> it seems so, yes. it seems it so seems long ago. Away. It's yeah. all a blur. <laughs> well, I think I was like writing postcards, making phone calls, Wisconsin, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, but Georgia, so. From that standpoint, I was uh, active. Okay. And another side of it, you know, I'm a New Yorker. So someone says, okay, go home. I said, like, oh, I got to go home. You know, it was kind of like, it was kind of like fun just, you know, really not having to go any place for a while. But fortunately, I got out enough. But that's the side of New Yorkers also. Home is a very comfortable kind of place. So I think we had a leg up on a lot of other people. Yeah, probably. I have a question for you all, and this is this feels like a selfish question because I teach it at, at the university level. So this is really a question for my 
for my my students um, because I told them I would I was going to be doing this and I said what would you want to know and um, they said what are your daily practices are there skills are there things that you do that you do every day that you feel is somehow a practice that's something that sustains you. And it can be something really simple. It doesn't have to be anything involved. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be doing a full yoga thing or is it meditation or is it just, is it pets? Is it, is it your, your grandkids? Is it, you know, what is it that sustains you? And do you have specific habits that you rely on? Yeah, Glenn. I think, I think one of the things that, that at least helped me, uh, through this period was the fact that I did do the same routines every day. You know, I, I, I get up in the morning and I meditate for an hour. And then I do uh, my, my body stretches for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then I do a voice warm up for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I start my day, but I do that every day. So it's kind of like it, it, uh, it sets the tone and, uh, and uh, it, it helps. It helps my mental process get ready for the day. That's beautiful. I love that the dailiness of it and the discipline of that. Bill, yeah. What about you? Uh, yeah, it's a fun, fun question. Uh, I, um, Gene Kelly started my love of dancing when I was a, a kid, and so I dance every day. <laughs> And uh, and that's sometimes a little hard in a studio apartment, uh, you know, but I've learned where the furniture is. But one of my joys is I love Johnny Mathis. He's always been my favorite and I have a bunch of his records and I put them on and I do what I call Commedia dell'art dancing. Oh. So whatever his singing is inspiring, you know, and I have some physical limitations now. And um, and it's wonderful. A friend of mine could gently kick me in the ass and said, you know, use what you got. And so I do, I, it's, it's just wonderful. And it, it's, uh, it replaces my going to the gym because I don't feel safe to do that yet. I also try to always write in the morning, you know, whatever it is. I write poetry every day, that's like my journal. And, uh, and also the other big thing is I talk to people. That's, because uh, I can get too much in my own head. And it's wonderful, and and that's one of the ways uh, of, that I participate in in uh, you know like I couldn't get out and march with BLM, but I could talk to people I know who were you know support the people who were doing that. And my first partner was a, a black man. We were high we met in high school, and and um, because of him, I have tried to you know do interracial casting and stuff like that. And, and now not, not being able to go out and do anything, it's been wonderful to be in touch with people, especially out of state or in other countries and be supportive about any types of, you know, dealing with prejudice or owning who you are. It's, there's so many opportunities. Thank you. Right, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um... For me, it's chocolate. <laughs> I mean, I gave up cold turkey, smoking three packs a day of cigarettes for years. Chocolate will never happen. I don't care if there was a 12-step program for it. But, um, but seriously, um, I, I've taken advantage of this thanks to the Actors Fund of their um, decluttering workshop and I'm, I'm in the process of doing my second round with it oh. so every, i'm trying to besides decluttering while i'm decluttering the whole purpose of it is to organize my archives yeah. and i and with their uh suggestions i do a certain amount every day a minimum and it's been very fascinating. I'm finding memorabilia from things I don't ever remember doing, but obviously I did because that's my picture, that's my bio in the program and so on. Um, but one of the reasons that it's so rewarding is many years ago, I had a mentor named Barbara Barandus McLean, who I met when she was in her late 80s. 
and she died in her mid 90s. And she had four incredible, successful careers, starting on Broadway in the 1920s, Hollywood in the 1930s, uh, work as a journalist, as an interior decorator, and then back to New York in the theater where I met her. And she kind of took me under her wing. And her apartment was like a museum of her careers. And uh, her dining room table was about the size of my studio apartment. But um, she took me around one day and everything on her walls was related to her careers. And she would point, to, she pointed once to a large framed full page ad from the New York Times from Macy's of her signature line of clothing from the, or from fabric from the 1940s. And she said to, she pointed out and she said, do you think anybody at Macy's would even know who I am? Do you think anybody would know anything about this? If you don't keep everything about your career, nobody else is going to do it. Mm. And, that and that was great advice because I realized that um, there were things I didn't keep, keep. There were things I did that were never photographed that should have been, could have been. So um, that's kind of been defining my my day each day in quarantine besides the Zoom meetings. And I also coach actors and playwrights, so the actors has been difficult. But um, I've continued to work with some playwriting clients by email, some from as far, as, as far away as Vancouver or Alabama. So I've been very busy <laughs> with, and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's not like I take a day off, you know, because <laughs> I check my email. Uh-oh, I got to deal with this. Or, oh, there's a Zoom meeting of this event. That's right. It's right in your house. It's not like you get to go to the office because there yeah. you are. <laughs> there you are. Yeah. I have a quite, kind of a bit of a follow-up question in a way to that. What do you all think? Have you thought about when this is all over? Um, what do you think theater is going to look like? How do you think this is going to change theater? How do you feel that this might change acting going forward? And how do you see yourself fitting into that? Do you think Zoom is always going to be, or well, some I think kind people, of manner of this no. is going to be part of I it? I think it's going to be a trust issue, and I think people are. We kind of have to go back and use these seasons. We're approaching the spring. There's going to be more events outdoors over the next year or so than we've ever seen before. So from that standpoint, uh, I think that's going to be the crux for the over the summer. Now, in the fall, I have a sense that theater may come back at maybe 30 percent or 40 percent but it, they may be redesigned or reconfigured or I'm, I'm not sure how they're going to work it, but it's, uh, it's going to take some time to build a trust. And I think the vaccine, there's so many things that go into it. It really is hard to uh, say. I'd like to see theater, you know, uh, come back. <laughs> but when uh, that will really be, it may be a couple of years down the line. Yeah. Possibly, yeah, Virginia. We've been doing so much uh, online and through cyberspace and everything, but ever since the first time I ever saw holograms, I always thought that in the future that the audience could be there, they would see two actors on the stage, one actor would actually be there, the other actor could be in California, but it's a hologram. And that's like our future, because have you seen the uh, the robots recently? You can't even tell them from people. I know. You know. It's so like all of this is moving forward like that. Yeah. So I truly think we'll have holograms on stage. Wow. <laughs> Phil, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, the one reason I'm glad I study theater history is because theater never dies. Whatever, whether it's in the courts of kings or in riverbeds, it always finds a way to live. And I, I think the Zoom arena will be a new aspect of theater. But I don't think 
uh, we'll ever lose live in-person theater because there is something about, there's a natural attraction of body warmth. And there is, a, I love movies, but there is a special thing about being in the same room. And when I'm, when I'm in the audience and an actor takes me into their world, makes me forget I'm sitting in a theater building, that to me is such a special art. And that can only happen in person. I, well, for me anyway. So I think it's, yeah, we're gonna have an expanded as people are saying, and it'll be interesting to see what, what evolves over the time. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Bill. I, I think it's gonna I do too. come back in some form to its original uh, because it's a, it's a very tactile experience and people like that. Yeah, being in the presence of, of others. Right. Is yeah. Incredibly powerful, it's why people, people go. So my last question before we open it up to, to questions um, from folks watching, including, uh, if I hope we have some, some other people who are also members of the uh, Performing Arts Legacy Project, other performers. Uh, I hope they feel free to chime in. And I also, I wanna say this, if, if you are um, a professional theater artist over the age of 62, and uh, if you are intrigued uh, by this and um, are interested, please, please um, seek, seek us out. Um, so my last question is this. If you had one bit of advice to give your, your yourself right now, if you were able to speak to your young, I don't know, 20 year old self or your 19 year old self, what do you think you would say to that young person? Bill? Um, Ashley, I would say to my young self what my first teacher in college and then Miss Hoggins said to me, be yourself. Don't try to be what you think other people want you to be. And that's what I have to offer, what each of us has to offer. I'm the only Bill. I'm the only one who can offer what I have to offer. And you know, that's what I would say to me again, if I went back. Thank you. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to kind of shift it to advice that I got from my younger sister uh, years ago. And I come because of my family legacy, which I've already mentioned, I come from a family of um, activists, of social workers. I'm the exception. And I remember years ago, I said to my sister, because I was feeling very, very guilty at not doing all the wonderful good works that they were all doing. Uh, my cousin was a freedom writer, writer in the South and actually ended up in prison in Mississippi, has the cutest mugshot on um, the internet. But, um, and my sister is, um, is on the board, her second term on Amnesty International, as well as doing uh, mitigation work on death penalty cases, all this stuff. And here I was working in the theater. And I said to her at one point, feeling very guilty, I wish I could do what you do. You see what's the, the injustice in the world and you get busy and you get two more political prisoners released and I just get upset. And her response was, why should you do what I do? Why don't you do what you do best? And so my activism is in my playwriting. And that shifted my gears completely to writing historical plays about injustice, about people whose lives have been distorted or ignored in popular culture, um, about racism, homophobia, uh, anti-immigration, and so on. And and that was the best advice that I that I got career wise because my place took off after that, in terms of getting a producer, of getting my work seen in other cities and in Europe and so on. So um, yeah, it's better than any advice I gave myself, and because all I did was feel guilty. So anybody else, any advice they would give to their their young self or a, a young person, yeah, Glenn. I, I would uh, tell my young self to uh, set a goal, uh, give yourself a time frame, mm -hmm. and after you've reached the end of that time frame, 
decide whether you're going to continue or do something else. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Virginia. I would tell myself to that performance is wonderful. It's, it's, it's everything to me. Um, but there is a business side if you are a professional. Mm -hmm. So don't forget there's a business side, which I hate and I'm terrible at. But I just discovered <laughs> that's one of the reasons, you know, that uh, I probably haven't done as much as I would like to do. Um, so the art and the business, you have to make sure that you're fed as much of the art so that the business doesn't mm -hmm. overcome you. So that's what I would tell my, and I'm not sure that I would stay in the profession because I am so hateful of the business side and what people have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, you know, in terms of you really find something that you uh, love and really want to do and specifically in terms of uh, theater, you have to decide uh, which star you're shooting for. If it's a community theater, that's fine. And if you want to go all the way to Broadway and become a, that star, that's a whole nother track. But yeah. in between that community theater and that stardom, there are a wide range of opportunities for uh, artists. And I think that's how most of us have been able to uh, survive. Absolutely. Not everyone knows my name, but I'm happy that I've met some very beautiful people along the way, and that's uh, life. You're talking about me, Jess? Uh, not, not, <laughs> not, not specifically. <laughs> I know. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> Kiss most that's wonderful, good. wonderful. Okay, pay me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't know if we have, are we getting any questions, Edith? You're, you're there, but are we getting any questions? We're, we're not getting questions. I've got some thumbs up on Facebook, but uh, um, I, I don't have any questions yet in the chat. I, I just okay. do want to say how beautiful you all have been and what it's just been extraordinary to hear your insights. Huge insights and beautiful. You know, I, I would be really curious about this. What do you think has surprised you the most about life in lockdown or, or during this pandemic? Was there anything that surprised you? I guess it was nothing but surprises, wall-to-wall -wall surprises, right? But Bill. Uh, yeah, I, the, I think the old phrase, random acts of kindness, mm. seeing you know, just seeing people on the street mostly just do something anonymously helpful for someone else. You know, some, it's the little things that really are the bricks of the building, I think. And that's, I was focusing on what we lost and then all of a sudden it was like, wow, but look what's happening. And I saw the same thing in 9-11 too. So we're resilient as humans when we let ourselves be. Thank you. That's beautiful. You know, it occurs to me too, um, we all in this Zoom room uh, have survived another pandemic, uh, the AIDS crisis. Mm. And I'm wondering how, how many of you or were you involved in, in any activism at that, that point or so much then? Yeah, Bill? Yeah. Oh, I already raised my hand again, but uh, yeah, I just have to say, yeah, that, that's helped me to get through this because that, that was another one. Um, and, and the main reason I raised my hand is I worked with an actor who was one of the, uh, the early people who succumbed to the illness, who changed my life because he, we were in a situation we had to rehearse for three months, not every day. And he told me the first day that he was just out of rehab. He had had a successful career. 
and he, I was directing, he said, I need to be honest with you if I get drink signals. And watching him deal with his art, which he was very talented, but seeing him also deal with his private Ill problems, it, it was so, um, it really was life changing. And, and it certainly helped me in many situations. And little did I know he was really preparing me to look at myself. And, and it just was another example of how theater, we do theater for entertainment, for different things, but it is so affects people's lives in ways we often don't even know about. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's so true. Yeah. Um, how many of you on this panel, I know the answer, but I, I want to, to see the show of hands. How many of you have worked with young people or are teachers or uh, wish to begin teaching? Okay. Um, I didn't catch the question. Could you? Oh, yes, absolutely. Sorry, Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, just how many of you um, are teachers, have taught in a teaching capacity? I mean, you're, you're working okay. with playwrights. I, that's teaching. Yeah. But at what level is it on the university level mm -hmm. or in a conservatory or one one on one coaching? And is that something that interests you passing on the torch in that way? Well, I coach, I don't teach. So I guess it's not me. <laughs> well, I taught in the, uh, well, I actually uh, had a degree to teach uh, theater in uh, public uh, schools. So uh, that was through the Board of Ed. But uh, I went on to work for the uh, Dramatist uh, Guild with the Young Playwrights uh, Festival. So I taught playwriting in schools for uh, several years. And then I had a couple of uh, young companies. Uh, one I took to uh, London, and we were in residence there for about a, a month at a place called Albany Empire. And then I had a, another company uh, in the mid 80s and uh, we were housed in uh, Glasgow and were guests of the uh, Scottish uh, Youth Theatre. And we also performed at the Edinburgh Festival. And then I taught for the uh, Scottish Youth Theatre in their uh, summer uh, festivals. But, uh, but the, I, I just like uh, theatre and uh, be it teaching, directing, uh, building a set, acting, it's uh, there's a lot of love in it, and it's uh, pretty much the same to me as long as I'm in the pit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely make helps you rekindle the love as well too, mm -hmm. for sure. Passing that on. Um, yeah, Bill. Anybody else want to go? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but I just said I love teaching. My my wonderful college mentor in directing class. He said directors and teachers are farmers. We don't create the plants, but our job is to water them, sometimes put manure on them and help them to become who they are in their seeds. And I never forgot that. And you know, he was that for me and so was Miss Hagen. And, and that's what I try to pass on. And the passing on is, you know, I, I once was regretting that I never had blood children of my own. And an actress friend of mine said, you know, think of all the students and actors who would have gotten a lot less attention if you had children of your own to take care of. So I feel good about that. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful to pass it on. They are your children. And I'm open. <laughs> You're an artist father. You're growing artists. Um, we are, Edith, we are at time, aren't we? I think we only have like two minutes left, yes? Yeah. Okay. I think. Um, any last thoughts? No pressure on that, but any last thoughts? Anything that you would like to say that you didn't get mm -hmm. to say? Yeah, I'd like to really put in a plug for the Actors Fund. Um, they came to my rescue several times, be way before I got involved with with Pal, and and this experience with Joan and and Pal has just been immeasurable. Um, in terms of confidence building to actually sit down and assess what I've accomplished when it did, always didn't feel like I did enough. Mm -hmm. And also to see online 
everybody from the stars to the unknowns coming together to raise money for the work that at the Actors Fund does. And um, I always recommend it. I said the money doesn't go to $100,000 retreats for the executives. It goes towards the services they provide. And that's really been significant in my life and to people I know and respect and care about and, and to all of us. And the, the theater community is a family I would not trade, you know, for any other family except my birth family, which I adore. That's well, for me, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your relatives. So I enjoy <laughs> all of you as people like, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Teresa and yeah. Joan. <laughs> Glenn, yes. I'd like to uh, put in a, a word about the HB studio um, in terms of uh, what it did for me back in the early 80s and mid 80s and then later on in the early 90s, I took classes there. And for somebody who was new to the city and new to the profession, it was like a, it was like a home because it was uh, people just like you, you know, starting out and taking classes at beginning intermediate levels. And so you learned you learned not only your craft, but you also learned to, to other people. You learn how to navigate those those old social circles and things like that. So it was it was a very positive experience for me. And uh, you know, as you know, they're they're uh, the the classes they aren't as expensive as other private studios are. So that that was always a positive thing. And and it was always a, a place that uh, I always uh, um, looked back on and thought it was a good experience and I'm glad I had that experience. And, and Edith has been uh, the head of that HP studio for quite a number of years now and, and it's still going strong. So, you know, kudos to her. Absolutely. Uh, so I, 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 in the mid nineties, I went back to start to take uh, playwriting classes too. So I, I kind of like both ends of it, but, but I thought those early years in terms of my experience in New York were, were vital and HB uh, helped fill, fill in a big, uh, a big void. Fantastic, thank you for that, Glenn. Yeah, Virginia. I'd like to thank Joan again because, and I, I agree with Barbara, everything she said, um, often you think you haven't done anything in the business, you know, but, Going through all the stuff, I'm, I'm like surprised at how much I had done. And uh, also the Actors Fund rescued me in LA when I was raising two kids alone. So kudo, kudo, kudos to the Actors Fund mm -hmm. and to Joan. Thank you, Joan. Joan. And also, just would like to express gratitude for the Actors Fund, especially Joan currently. But when I first came to New York in the 60s, there was a man named John Efrat, who was absolutely incredible. And throughout my career, the Conrad Jansen Shoe Funds for Actors Out of Work, uh, the fund helps people find housing. There's all kinds of um, education. As a friend of mine says on stage, we deal with the art stuff. And the Actors Fund takes care of the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. And for me, that about sums it up. That's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, I know that we are at time, but I can't thank you enough for your time and, and for your presence here and for your wisdom. This has been really helpful for me. Um, and I know very helpful for um, people listening and people who will see it. So. Thank you so much to the Actors Fund, to Joan uh, Jeffrey and Pal. Uh, and just a reminder, if you're interested, please, please join up, please give to the Actors Fund. But thank you so much, Virginia and Bill and Barbara and Joan and Glenn and Jasper and Edith, as always, thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa. Thank, thank you, Teresa. Thank you. Thank you. And Edith. Thank you.